every single day there is either a kid or a parent in my office talking about, or a friend, you know, one of my kids' parents talking to me at a soccer game or something like that about a bully. And I think it's important to have a conversation up front about really what is bullying and how would we define bullying. Um, so the National Bullying Prevention Center talks about three key factors in bullying. They talk about that the behavior hurts, humiliates, or harms another person physically or emotionally. Those targeted by the behavior have difficulty stopping the action directed at them and struggle to defend themselves. And that's an important thing that as parents and professionals, we need to be paying attention to. This difficulty stopping the action directed at them, sometimes we jump in and actually don't give our kids the skills that they might need to be able to stop that for themselves. So that's something to be thinking about, and we'll get back to that. But there's also a real or perceived imbalance of power, which is described as when the student with the bullying behavior has more power either physically, socially, or emotionally, is seen as sort of in a power role, um, a higher social status, or is physically larger or emotionally intimidating than the student or the child who's feeling bullied, who is being bullied. But I refer to bullying as the B word because I think while I am by no means an advocate for bullying, I'm not pro-bullying, I do believe that bullying has become sort of a hot, topic and, and a word that is thrown around very casually, that I'm being bullied or somebody's bullying my daughter or there's a bully in her class or his class. Um, and I think it's really important to step back and ask this question. What, and I, when I say ask this question, I mean really think about this question and to help our kids think about this question. It didn't make you feel good, but was it really bullying? Or could it have been something else? Is it really that your friend is in some sort of higher power position and chooses to, is trying to hurt you by not swinging on the swings with you? Or is your friend actually choosing to swing on the swings because she feels like swinging on the swings today? It's not really bullying. But I do hear kids talking to me about their teachers bullying them. Well, what do you mean? What's going on? That's obviously very serious, and I want to take that seriously if a teacher is bullying a student. Wow, she gave me so much homework tonight. You know, that's not actually bullying. That's the teacher doing his or her job, right? And so it's important to distinguish between friendly teasing, what we might refer to as somebody is just not thinking, somebody is just being, or some other important things, conflict, or problems to solve. And I, I distinguish between conflict and problems to solve, and we'll talk about how I distinguish that. But friendly teasing, someone is trying to joke with you. The intention is to have a good time. This is somebody who wants to have a good time with you, doesn't want to hurt your feelings, is usually friendly towards you, and the key part is this person will probably stop or change if you ask her to. So remember when I talked about some of the key factors of bullying, one of them is that the person who is being bullied feels unable to stop or defend themselves. Sometimes we, we don't support kids in saying, can you stop doing that? That bugs me. That what we're, we're actually teaching them to sort of skip that step and go to a teacher you know, and tell, uh, tell the teacher about the problem or tell the parents about the problem. And we, we sidestep the kid being able to stand up for themselves. And that's something that's important, especially as we get into talking about conflict resolution. Sometimes people are just not thinking. So they, they're not thinking about you. They're maybe paying attention to something else. You know, he bumps into you in the hallway because he's looking down. He's not looking where he's going, and he, sh and he shoves you. It's not bullying, it's just not paying attention to you. You're not, you know, contrary to what you might believe, you're not the center of everybody else's world. And so sometimes people do things that don't make you feel good, that bother you or upset you. 
but it is not a personal attack. The intention is not to personally hurt you. They might be paying attention to something else. They might be having a bad day. Or related to that, they're just being. So someone is just doing what he or she is supposed to be doing or what he or she wants to do. That's the example of the teacher assigning homework. Or sometimes I hear kids talking to me about being bullied at recess. And when I talk to them about, well, you know, tell me what does that look like? What's happening? Well, when I got out at kickball, the whole other team started cheering. Well, yeah, that's the whole other team playing kickball because their goal is to get you out, right? That's not bullying. It doesn't feel good when you get out and when other people celebrate that, but it's not bullying in the sense of trying to hurt you personally. Somebody might be just choosing what they want to do, swinging on the swings instead of playing what you want to play. It's not bullying. They also get to choose what they want to do. Um, they might be standing where there's, you know, a lot of times for younger kids who have classroom jobs, some, there are some kids who like to always get a certain job like line leader or something like that, and they'll feel very hurt or upset if somebody else gets to be the line leader, even though their popsicle stick was picked, right? Or, or sometimes people get very upset if they're not called on every time they raise their hand and, and report that as bullying. The teacher is bullying me. She never calls on me. Okay. Conflict is different than bullying. And while I'm not pro-bullying, pro I think true bullying is something that we need to make sure that we're supporting kids, that they're not in that position where they're truly powerless, and that we put in place the supports that they need. I am actually pro-conflict, because people learn from conflict. Conflict is a part of almost every relationship, and you can grow from conflict. A lot of times, good things come out of conflict. Conflict is when there's a disagreement or argument with each side having opposing views or goals. You might have a conflict, I mean most friends have conflicts with each other, but sometimes you have a conflict with a complete stranger, somebody who you, you don't really have any sort of ongoing relationship with, um, but maybe you're, you know, in conflict over a parking spot or something like that. So you can have a conflict with a stranger. Today, obviously, we're talking about it with friends, people you're having an ongoing relationship with. The other person has, a, each person has a goal in mind that may be incompatible with each other. But in typically developing kids, at very young ages, kids are monitoring and paying attention to their play partner. So at as early as two or three years old, typically developing kids want to play with someone else. It's much more fun to play with someone else than to play alone. And even your bossiest two or three year old, who's a, you know, we can say that they're a leader, they're a director, they, they're strong, they know what they're doing, they're going to come into conflict with somebody that they're playing with who doesn't always feel like being the mom or making spaghetti or, or eating the cookies or whatever. They don't always feel like doing what they're being told to do. But that bossy little kid, if they're typically developing, is generally keeping an eye on how much can I push this person so that I get my goals met I get to do what I want to do and still keep them playing with me. And that's, and that's a very sophisticated um, cognitive process going on in very young kids. So with conflicts occurring between friends, typically developing kids are usually paying attention to, okay, how much can I push my goal, my agenda, without pushing you away? And that's something that we can um, be paying attention to when we're helping our kids to try to figure out if what's happening is bullying, if it's a conflict between friends, if it's somebody's just not thinking about them or just doing their own thing. I think when conflict, when there are repeated types of conflicts, there are patterns in the types of problems that someone is having within, in an, a relationship where they're 
considering this is my friend, this is an ongoing relationship, then that might be a problem to solve. This comes up a lot of times with, um, well, let's say you've got a sort of a natural born leader, right? And they, they always have great ideas for play. They, this is what they want to do. They're creative. They've got good ideas. And then you've got a kid who's happy to go along with the friend's ideas much of the time, but sometimes feels like they want to pick the game to play or they want to make the rules. For a lot of times, it's not a big deal. It's a conflict, but kids kind of, when left alone, can manage that pretty well much of the time. If it becomes a pattern and a kid is saying, she never lets me pick the game, she ne we always have to play by her rules, well, that, I think, becomes a problem to solve. If this is your friend and you want to keep that friendship, this is a problem to solve. Because your goals are important, and, you're, and we're thinking about boundaries, helping our kids to set boundaries, what they're okay with, what they're willing to, to deal with in a friendship, and when somebody crosses that line and is starting to maybe not be such a good friend for them. Um, but with this pattern of conflict, when you're thinking, is this a problem to solve, it's a friend, you're not feeling good. You're just generally, you've got that feeling of like, I don't know if I want to play because we're shifting the balance from I usually feel good playing with this person to I sometimes feel good playing with this person and I sometimes feel pretty bad playing with this person. I like the person. We have a good time. I like these parts about the person, but these are the parts that I don't like. That's a problem to solve, and, that, and we can re, this is where we can really help our kids with these problems to solve. You want the other person to understand your perspective and your feelings. Like, sometimes I want to take a turn picking the game. You want something to change. I want a turn picking the game sometimes. You know, I want you to let me make the rules every now and then. And we'll talk about how you can help your kids um, have those conversations. But the reason why I think it's important to distinguish between bullying or friendly teasing or just not thinking or just being or a conflict, a problem to solve, is because our language, the way we talk about what's happening, frames it up for our kids and orients them towards what they're going to do about it. Saying that someone is a bully and someone is bullying you makes the person feel like a victim and powerless. What we want to do is, if, if it's truly bullying, we do have to put supports in place to help that kid. And there are kids who are truly bullied, and, and we do need to support them. But if it's a conflict with a friend or a problem to solve with a friend, we want to talk about it in ways that helps our kids feel empowered to stand up for themselves, and to make some changes for the betterment of that relationship. But when we say you're being bullied, that person's bullying you, it, it, it makes that kid feel like there's really not much they can do about it, but they need an adult or someone else to step in and intervene. So how we talk about it is important, and how we react is important. If a kid comes home complaining about somebody not being nice to them, or if you witness something, you, you know, you're seeing your kid playing with somebody, and you witness something that you think is not very nice, if you go right in there and, you know, the kid goes home and you say, I saw him grabbing all your toys and he wasn't sharing with you at all, and it, he was being really mean, or did you feel bad? Did you think he was being mean? Do you want to keep playing with him? If you're Asking questions in that way, you're sending your child a, one of a couple different messages. One message might be that your friend is mean, and it might not actually be something that bothered your kid. So going back to that natural born leader, there are some kids who enjoy playing with leaders because those leaders come up with really good creative ideas. You know, maybe, they're, maybe in their family they've got a big brother or sister who takes charge, and they're comfortable being in the role of follower. They like it, but maybe you're more of a leader. And so if you see your kid being kind of bossed around by somebody, you're seeing it as being bossed around. 
Whereas the, your kid might not see it as a bad thing at all, might see it as, this is fun, she comes up with the best games, right? So it might not be a problem for your kid. And if you're talking to your child about it like this is a bad thing, your child's going to feel like, oh, maybe I was misinterpreting that person and my time with that person. Maybe it's not fun. Maybe I'm not having a good time. Kids also learn very quickly to respond in ways that grab their parents' attention. So that, let's step aside from bullying and peer relationships, but if you think about um, a kid who's complaining of a stomach ache, you know, and they're saying, like, my tummy hurts. And you kind of watch them, and they're playing pretty typically. And they're, like, in a pretty good mood, and they're jumping around, and they're asking for snacks and things like that. Their behavior is telling you that they feel okay. But when you say, how's your tummy? Right away, oh, it hurts, kind of hurts, right? They go back into that sort of, oh, yeah, it doesn't feel so good role. But they're acting well. You know, and so that's something that I think we have to be paying attention to is are we asking questions and giving our kids a ton of attention, especially this comes up with, like, let's say a kid comes home and says they've been having trouble on the bus with Bobby. If your first question when they walk in the door is, how was Bobby today? Was he mean to you? Was Bobby, did Bobby do anything on the bus? Your kid's going to learn that talking about Bobby and all the nasty things he does is highly rewarding because it grabs your attention. You're going to get involved in this long conversation about it. And so you may not really get an accurate representation of how your kid's feeling about it when you're asking about Bobby. When you're just kind of going kind of casual with the evening and your kid brings up, Mom, do I have to take the bus tomorrow? You know, that's when you start to think, hmm, why is he talking about that? You know, I don't know. I, I think so. I mean, you usually take the bus. What's going on? <gasps> well, Bobby, he's always doing blah, blah, blah. That gives you a sense that this is something that maybe is bothering your kid, and, it's, and you want to go down that, that path and have that conversation explore. But you try to let your kid bring it up instead of interviewing Interviewing for pain, sometimes we call it. Strategies for managing. I mentioned don't assume the worst. So don't be assuming that your kid is feeling bad about something that they may or may not be feeling bad about. Um, and so start that conversation. When you're starting a conversation, I'll, I'll, I talk about, like, you've got to act natural. You've got to act like... Put your poker face on and just kind of, huh, oh, you're having trouble on the bus? What's going on? Instead of like, well, hold on, let me put the dinner aside. I'm going to sit right down and what's happening on the bus? Who's doing what to you and when are they doing it and what are their parents' names? I'm going to call the school right away. We don't want to have that kind of reaction because your child might shut down because this is actually their friend. And they really actually don't want you to think that. And that happens a little bit as kids get older. They don't really want to tell their parents about problems with their friend because now their parents don't like that person. Why, why do you want to have her come over? She's not a nice friend. It's a very fixed mindset. She's a good friend. She's a bad friend. He's a nice friend. He's a bully, right? Instead of people are kind of fluid. You know, sometimes they do jerky things. But overall, they're a pretty nice, fun friend. And when somebody's doing a jerky thing and is a friend to you, it's okay to have some boundaries and say, stop doing that jerky thing because I want to stay your friend. But, and, we can, and that's okay. It's not, oh, you know, I'm a woman scorned. You've hurt me and I will never go back to you again. You know, that friends come and go. I mean, young kids are constantly saying things like, I'm not going to be your best friend if you don't do this. I'm not going to be your friend anymore if you don't do this. And the next day, they are friends again. It, that is the way that younger elementary school friendships go in a very normal way. So don't necessarily assume the worst that somebody's a victim, but it might just be a typical kind of back-and-forth friendship situation that's going on. The other thing is, I think when we have these conversations with our kids, 
we're looking for the problem and we're looking for the, our solution. So if a kid says, um, so-and-so is, is talking about me at school, oftentimes, and when I talk to kids about this, I will ask them, oh, did you say anything to your mom or dad about that? Yes. What did they say? They said, ignore it. They said, tell the teacher. They said, tell them to stop. They said, whatever. The pattern is that parents are telling kids what to do. We don't want to tell our children what to do in these kinds of situations. We want to empower our kids to make their own choices about what to do. And we should be listening to our kids because a lot of times they have a solution. They don't need us to tell them what to do. They might already have an idea of what to do. So before we jump in to say, do this, it's a good idea to ask, have you thought about what to do? Have you thought about how you're going to handle that? Do you have a plan for that? And if they say, no, I don't know what to do, then we're going to talk about helping them brainstorm and helping them decide how to manage that problem. But avoid jumping in with the solution already. It's not one size fits all. And this comes up a lot, actually more with, with older kids and teenagers, I think, and parents. When they have kind of opposite personalities, I think. So I, I, I will always think of a teenage girl. She was like in eighth grade. And um, her mom felt she was being kind of like a doormat, you know, that her friends were walking all over her and taking advantage of her. And this girl was always dropping everything for any friend. And the mother was like a very no-nonsense, you know, um, kind of take charge woman. And she was like, you're weak. You're being weak. You have to tell them to stop. You've got, you know, you've got to do this. You've got to do that. And it made the eighth grader feel like she couldn't talk to her mom about that stuff because she would never be comfortable with her mom's approach to managing that problem. So she never really wanted to talk to her mom about it. And her mom desperately wanted to help the daughter, right? But her solutions, she was only seeing her way of doing things, not really putting herself in her daughter's shoes and thinking about what's her style in doing this. And we all have our own, you know, some of us are better with humor than others. Some of us are better with talk, at, you know, talking. Some of us are better at writing things out. Some of us are better at ignoring than others. And so we all have different sort of go-to moves in dealing with conflict. It's not a one-size-fits-all. And there's not one right way to solve a problem. It has to be a way that somebody feels comfortable with and that they have the confidence to pull off. So that's something that you can't tell your kid what to do. They have to really be involved in coming up with that and feel comfortable putting that solution into place. When you do have an idea about what to do, role play, practice. If you're talking to your kids about standing up for some, to somebody, I, I was just talking about this with somebody an hour before I came here. A girl who um, was saying that somebody, she's in middle school, she was saying somebody's falling asleep in class and then wants her notes, you know, asks my patient for her notes so she can copy them down. And she's constantly telling uh, my patient about all of her problems and things like that. My patient's a really nice kid. She's a sweet kid. She doesn't want to hurt this person's feelings. She does, she kind of gives a lot of mixed messages. She'll say things like, oh, I'm sorry, I have to go over here now. Oh, I, I would, but I can't really do that because I told so-and-so I'd go talk to her. Instead of, no, I'm not comfortable with that. And my patient didn't actually think she was allowed to say, no, I'm not comfortable with that, because she's such a, she's been really taught and reinforced for being so nice all the time. She felt like saying, no, I'm not comfortable with that, isn't a nice thing to say to someone who needs help with their notes. And so we did a lot of practicing, you know, for her to say, I'm really not comfortable with that. She practiced around. This sounds like a little detail, but she practiced around saying, I'm sorry I'm not comfortable with that, or I'm not really comfortable with that. 
And she had to try it out a lot of different times and say it in front of a mirror and say it to me. And just practicing however you're going to stand up for yourself or deal with that conflict, practicing at home helps your child to feel more comfortable and confident doing it with the peer in the moment instead of having an adult take care of it for them or tell them what to do. I, I think modeling boundaries is a great thing to do. And, and you can do that by modeling boundaries for your family, whether it's something as simple as, um, you know, you leave your, your phone away from the dinner table, and if you hear it ringing, you're saying, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to answer that right now. It's not as important as having dinner with you. That's a boundary that you're modeling, right, that it's okay to say no to answering that. Or a friend, you know, wants you to meet for dinner or something, and you're tired, and you don't really feel like doing it, saying, I have a really long week. Let's pick a different time. And telling, you know, making it obvious, talking to your partner, saying, yeah, she invited me to dinner, but I just really didn't want to go, so I told her we'd have to pick a different time, that we don't have to – for our young empaths, we don't always have to give everything of ourselves. It's okay to say no. It's okay to have boundaries. It's okay to make those boundaries firm. It's also okay to be flexible with those boundaries. So sometimes someone's going to do, like, this comes up a lot in middle school, especially with social media and people seeing that, you know, oh, this person told me they couldn't hang out, but I see them on Snapchat hanging out with somebody else. You know, that, that how do you sort of let someone know that bothers me or decide I'm just going to let it go and I'm going to understand that maybe there's someone who's not a friend I can always count on, but to be a little flexible about those boundaries sometimes. You don't always have to stand up for yourself if you don't want to. You don't have to, but you, it's okay to personally recognize someone let me down. And I, and I might not let them get away with that for too much longer. Does that make sense? Um, but, and so we are modeling, and we're practicing these kinds of standing up for yourself at home. We're reinforcing strategies at as much as is possible. So a lot of times in families, we do friendly teasing, just as a family. Or, and, you know, some families are different than others. My family, we do a lot of friendly teasing. If I tease somebody in my family and they say, Mom, stop. I don't like it when you call me that. I should probably, and I try to say, I'm sorry, I didn't know that that bothered you. And I try to stop. Because I want to teach my kids that if you tell someone, this is my boundary, I don't like this, they should listen. If there's a lot of talk people, this comes up with like tickling, you know, and sometimes people sort of tickle tease and that tickle, 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 and someone's like, stop, stop, stop. Well, some people don't like to be tickled. And if someone's telling you stop, don't we want to reinforce that if you don't want someone to touch you and you say stop, they should stop. And so that's what we're trying to teach. If if someone's teasing you and you don't like it in your family and you say, Can you stop, I really don't like it when you tease me about that. We should stop because that reinforces the standing up and it reinforces this concept that in healthy, positive relationships, if it's truly friendly teasing, they will stop or change when you let them know this is not a good time. And so we want to make sure we're, we're teaching that through not just our words but our actions. So with friendly teasing, we, we can suggest as a solution, tell the person it bugs you and ask them to stop. And you try to do that, you practice that in whatever way is developmentally appropriate and is typical for that, um, that social group. That, you know, what's the language that they use? Do they talk about, um, would they say something like, not, knock it off. Kids don't really say knock it off, you know, but as adults, we might say, tell them knock it off. That bothers me. But I don't hear kids say knock it off. They say stop or something else, you know. Um, so you can tell somebody straight up, stop. That's not funny. You can use I statements, which I think I have an example of I statements, but that's I feel blank when you blank 
and because blank, and I wish you would blank. So it's just filling in the blanks. I always talk about with I statements, um, you just have to be respectful, right? You're trying to use an I statement where it's not pushing somebody away. So one of my favorite I statements, this was when I was in graduate school doing a group of, about anger management for little, like, eight-year-old boys. And I had the I statement up on the chalkboard, and this one little kid volunteered, raised his hand to, to give his I statement. And his I statement was, I feel like punching you when you take my Game Boy, because it is not yours, and I wish you would, when you are walking home from school, fall and have your face land in a pile of dookie. I said, well, you definitely followed the rules here, and you filled in the blanks, but let's remember, uh, we're trying to be kind. We want someone to listen to our message and not necessarily shut it out. So sometimes the I statements need a little bit of tweaking. Um, compliment sandwiches. I'll go over a compliment sandwich. I've got a slide for that. Sometimes, if it's friendly teasing, sometimes just laugh and move on. Like sometimes somebody's just, they're just joking. They're not trying to hurt your feelings. It's something that could be funny if it doesn't truly hurt your feelings. Sometimes laughing and moving on is a perfectly appropriate solution. If it hurts your feelings, if it's something that's kind of like a sore subject for you, then maybe that's a problem to solve as opposed to this friendly teasing where you just move on. So this is a nice statement. Compliment sandwiches. It's, you know, you say something positive, you state the problem, you suggest a solution, and then you say something positive again. Compliment sandwiches work kid to kid, work adult to adult, work adult to kid. You know, we all can use compliment sandwiches to make requests. So this would look something like, and this is something you would have to practice with kids. But compliment sandwiches might be something like, um, I think you have, I love playing with you because you have such good ideas. I feel like we usually play games your way, and sometimes I would like to take a turn making up the rules because I really have a good time when we play together, and I want to keep doing that. Right, so it's saying something positive. You have really good ideas. I love playing with you. The problem, it's always your ideas. The solution, can we take turns? Or can I have a turn? Because I want to keep playing with you. I like having this friendship. That's the compliment sandwich. When You've identified that it's not bullying, it's maybe somebody just being or just not thinking. We can teach our kids to change the thought. So this, and this is something that adults work on as well. If someone's just being or just not thinking and they're doing something that's bothering you, like um, maybe they are, they, they didn't invite you over to their house something like that. They, they had a birthday party and they were allowed to invite, or a birthday celebration, they were allowed to invite one person and it wasn't you and you found out about it. You might be thinking, she doesn't like me. Or you might think, well, she was only allowed to invite one friend and maybe her mom suggested that person. Maybe that friend invited her over to her house. It's not about me. You know, it's not that she didn't like me. She was only allowed to have one friend over. I sometimes have to pick just one friend, and I don't always pick her. That kind of thing where you're helping change the thought that it's not, she doesn't like me, now I feel bad. It's, she could only pick one friend, and it wasn't me this time. We're still friends. I feel okay. Putting yourself in somebody else's shoes. So, like, I've had to only pick one friend. Some, my parents have told me I could only have one person come over, and they didn't want to have to drive anybody. And so they told me I had to pick somebody in my neighborhood who could walk over, something like that. That You know, this sometimes this happens. But being able to widen the perspective and see how it might not be the way you're looking at it. It could be that someone's just not thinking about you and doing something that they are, that's imposed upon them or that they have to do. 
but teaching things like self-soothing, because if you're not picked to go to somebody's party, it doesn't feel good. It might not necessarily be bullying. It might be that that person could only invite a couple people, and those happen to be the people that they picked. It's still not going to feel good. And that might not be something. You might not do anything about that. You might not say, hey, um, I thought we were really good friends, and you had a party and didn't invite me. So next time you have a party, can you invite me? Because I want to come to your parties. They look fun. That, sometimes that's not the way it works. Sometimes somebody's not going to invite you to a party. It's not going to feel good. And so we can teach. That stinks. That feels, I remember when that happened to me. That, that feels really bad, you know. And it's okay. It's okay for our kids to be hurt by their friends from time to time. Because if you think about the person who is closest to you in your life, my guess is that at some point or other, they've let you down or hurt you. And you've continued to have a relationship with that person. You've healed from that, and you've moved on, and you've learned something from it. It's okay to feel bad that you weren't invited to something. We don't always have to fix that in our kids. You know, that they, they can learn from feeling bad that they feel better, that they move on. That, you know, I, and if you think about your childhood, there might have been a time where somebody really hurt you and you remember it. Like, you still remember it. It still feels bad. And there are probably other times where someone hurt you and you think about it and you kind of laugh now. Like, I can't believe that was such a big deal. You know, that your kids are going to experience both sides of those things. They're going to grow up remembering how bad they felt about I, I, My kids laugh at me because I tell them about my best friend, who's still such a good friend today. Um, I went over to her house. She called me and invited me to over to her house. I went to her house. I walked. We had, were kind of like neighbors, and we were allowed to walk into each other's houses. I walked into her house, and I couldn't find her. And her mom said she was in her room. And I walked up to her room, and I couldn't find her. And there was somebody else over, too, another kid in our neighborhood. And I had that realization. I was in, like, fifth or sixth grade. They're hiding on me, you know? And they're, like, this is a game to them. They're hiding on me, and they're kind of, like, laughing that I'm looking around for them, and I can't find them. And I went home, and I listened to Wilson Phillips' um, hold on, like on repeat, and cried in my room. And I don't think my parents had any idea what was going on, but I was okay. I, she's my, one of my best friends now, and I sort of, it stands in my mind as a time I felt bad, but it's not something that ruins me. And so if our kid feels sad about not getting invited to a party, our reaction can't be, this is going to ruin you. This is going to ruin your life. It's, yeah, it feels bad to get left out sometimes. You know, it's okay to sit with that and help them feel better in some way. Teaching the shrug. So we talk about, like, sometimes people say something is not that nice, or, and this works with siblings a lot, sibling to sibling. Um, but the shrug is just, someone says something like, um, dude. I can't believe you lost in that game. Or, like, you know, you're playing video games. Dude, come on. Right? And maybe you don't like it that someone talks to you that way, but you might not decide to have a compliment sandwich. You know, like, I feel kind of hurt when you um, point out that I lost in a video game and I wish you would be a little bit kinder. Maybe that's not the time for an I statement. Maybe it's the time for a shrug. So we go over with kids, you know, what's a shrug? It's, you can do a one-shoulder shrug. You can do a two-shoulder shrug. You know, it's, right? You don't, sometimes you don't have to say anything. Just like, dude, I can't believe you lost. Right? That, and move on. That you don't always have to address everything. And sometimes people say things that are not that nice to you, but you can handle it. Now, if somebody is truly being bullied, and it's a different sort of situation where there really is, someone in a power position intending to make someone feel bad, intending to harass and bully, that's different. We're not going to shrug those off all the time. You might, you might suggest a shrug every now and then. But a shrug is a modern version of ignoring. Because sometimes we tell kids to ignore it, but some kids are not good at ignoring. Ignoring really means that you're showing somebody it doesn't matter. But if a kid is like, 
you know, I'm going to be really red faced and I'm kind of really mad. That's not truly ignoring. We can see it on your face that this is bothering you, right? But this is why I think it works a lot with siblings. Because if you can teach them, like, you know, just sort of a, a shrug and a sigh kind of thing, it gives them something to do with that uncomfortable feeling, but it's not like a huge upset reaction that's going to be reinforcing for somebody else. Um, and moving on, uh, this story is called, I love this story, it's called A Heavy Load, and I found it in a book called um, Zen Shorts. It's about two monks who are traveling on down the road, and they come across a very wealthy woman and her servants, and they're carrying her shopping bags, and she's on a sedan chair, and they come across this really, like, muddy area, and she can't get across the, the area, her servants can't get her across without damaging, like, her packages or whatever. And so the older monk, an old monk and a young monk, the older monk walks over, puts her on his back, carries her across to, like, dry land safety. The old monk, she's rude. She doesn't say thank you. She just kind of walks away um, with her servants and her packages and everything. Splashes mud in his face, whatever. The old monk and the young monk continue walking down the road, and the young monk, after a little while, says, I can't believe her. You helped her out. She was so rude. How is this not bothering you? And he says, I put her down miles ago. Why are you still carrying her? And that can be a powerful message for some of our grudge holders. You know, some, sometimes there are conflicts that are really, like, not a big deal, if it's a big deal, that's a problem to solve. We're going to handle it differently. But if it's not a big deal and you've got a grudge holder who holds on to every little injustice when it might be somebody's just being or just not thinking about you, that's when we can tell them, let it go. You know, you don't have to carry that around with you. You don't have to hold on to all these uncomfortable feelings, you can just let it go. And so you can teach, teach it in a number of ways. That story is one of them. But when we have conflicts, we can teach our kids negotiating. And many of our kids already know how to negotiate, right, for a later bedtime or another snack or dessert or more screen time or something. They're actually pretty good at negotiating. And so when you're talking about modeling, you know, and boundaries and things like that, I'm actually a parent who puts up with a lot of negotiating because I think long term. I want my kids to be good negotiators. I want my kids to be good at knowing this is what I want, and I'm going to learn how to respectfully ask for it or get a little bit more of what I want. I actually kind of appreciate that in kids. I don't appreciate it when I'm trying to just get my kid to bed and I don't want them to come out of their room anymore, but I do appreciate it when I think about them as an adult or when I think about them trying to get a little more of what they need from somebody in a, in a, health, in a positive way. So negotiations, if your kid doesn't already know it, you can teach it. If your kid does know how to negotiate, Teach them how to negotiate in a respectful way. So you reinforce it by, like I was talking about, you know, if your kid says, hey, can you stop? That's bothering me. You say, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't, didn't know that was bothering you. I'll stop calling you that. With negotiations, if your kid's offering a respectful, you know, it, negotiating in a respectful way, coming up with a compromise or a, hey, what, if, if I do that, would you let me do this? And it seems reasonable, make kind of a big deal, not a big deal, but point it out in an intentional way, you know, that seems pretty reasonable. I don't see why I can't be flexible here. That sounds good to me. You know, so you're, you're reinforcing that ability to ask for what they want in a respectful way, if it's reasonable for you. Compromises, you know, kids know how to compromise. Kids know how to find a fair way. If you ask a kid, like, how do you figure out who's going to be it at recess, they'll tell you, oh, we do blue shoe, blue shoe. We do rock, paper, scissors. We do this. We do that. They've got their own ways of finding a fair way. They know how to take turns. And they don't worry because most kids are actually very good at all of those things if we let them do it. 
And that's where I think we as adults kind of get in the way. There's a lot of adult structured activities around kids. You know, we, we talk about this all the time, right? Our kids aren't just running outside in the morning and coming home when the street lights come on. They're going to school. They've got recess monitors at, at recess. They're coming home. They're going to soccer or they're going to some sort of structured activity or daycare or something like that where there are adults there to referee and monitor. And so they're not actually left to do a lot of this on their own. I also think when we live in a house that's like kind of more of an open concept, you know, when our kids are like always there, we jump in more often than we need to. We kind of have this feeling, I think, as parents, like if one of our kids with siblings, siblings practice a lot of conflict resolution with each other. If one sibling says something like, you know, mom, she took my whatever, num noms, we feel like we have to respond. But the truth is we don't actually have to respond. We don't have to say, give her back her num noms. We don't have to put an order in place. We can say, oh, and walk away and let them figure it out. It feels really weird to just say, oh, did she? But when you say that, you're sending the message to your kids, you can figure that out. I think you can handle this, right? And, and you walk away. Um, so when we have problems to solve, we talked about boundaries. It is okay to teach in relationships that you have boundaries. Boundaries are taking, it's taking care of yourself. You know, it's, everybody has boundaries that helps them feel good. It helps me feel good to have boundaries. It helps me take care of myself to have boundaries. It helps take care of our friendship when we each have our own boundaries. You can make them, you can keep them. When we have problems to solve, we want to identify the problem. So a big part of that is defining what is the problem. You know, is the problem that somebody is taking advantage of you or not listening to what you want to do or making you feel bad about something or whatever it is. But we want to make sure that we're actually helping our kids identify the problem. That's where we can support is to identify the problem. And then we can invite our kids to to solve the problem. Like, is that something that, have you thought about what you're going to do? Do you have any plans for that? We can then work on it. So if they say, I don't know what to do, we can help offer suggestions and brainstorm. So what we talked about, like, I talked about if you're observing it on a play date, kind of, as opposed to just jumping in and, and taking over or telling your kid later, I saw him not being nice to you. I learned this from a teacher, and I think it's a great um, reminder for us as adults. But she talks about in their school, they teach their teachers to wait. And wait means, why am I talking? And I think that's when, we're, uh, when we've observed something that we think might not be very kind behavior or might be a conflict or a problem to solve with our kid and a friend, we might want to just wait and see if our kid brings it up, or, see, or wonder, you know, like, I saw um, that you had some ideas for what to do, and Sally didn't really want to do your ideas. I wonder if that ever makes you feel bad, or I wonder, I wonder how you feel about that is probably a better way to ask it, but wonder instead of assume, and, and you can ask your kid, how do you feel about that, or does that happen? Do, does that happen a lot or do you, you know, whatever. Or you can even just say, what do you like about playing with so-and-so? And you get a different perspective of what they like about playing with that person. When I talk about casually offering support and casually checking in, that's that sort of like play it cool, um, oh, yeah, well, if you ever want to talk about that, you know, you can let me know. So you're just sort of planting seeds that, you're not assuming that something's a problem in case it's not a problem for your kid, but you're sort of planting seeds that if it's something that they feel like becomes a problem, they can talk about it with you. You can, if you, if they've mentioned, yeah, I don't like it when they do that, you can casually check in about it. So that's not interviewing for pain where you're saying, um, 
did she do that again to you today? You know, do, how did she make you feel today? Was she mean to you today? But it's more like, so how are things going? You know, and then you can kind of get into it a little bit more specific, a little bit more specific, like, have you been, who are you playing with at recess? Or like, have you been playing with Sally? You know, how's that going? Did you ever try talking to her? Did you ever try that compliment sandwich? Did you ever try talking to her? How did that go? So you can kind of just, you're not saying, is she still mean to you? But you're just asking about how, how um, is the relationship moving on? If your kid talks to you, mentions something to you about a problem, you know, I, I don't really want to go on the bus anymore, and is telling you about why they don't want to go on the bus, and somebody's being mean to them on the bus. Like, the number one rule is just be cool. Like, you cannot jump on that. Like, who's being mean to you? What are they doing? I'm going to call their parents right away. Or if you do that, do it in a kind of a joking way. But um, you want to listen more than talk. So you and the way that psychologists get kids to talk is we just repeat what they're saying. So if somebody says, I, don't, I hate going on the bus. I hate taking the bus. You hate taking the bus. You just repeat back what the kid says. Yeah, I hate taking the bus because... Billy's on it, and he's always shoving me up. He always makes me sit on the window. Oh, so Billy's always making you sit by the window. Yeah, and I hate it because I want to sit on the aisle sometimes. Too. And you don't like it because you want to sit on the aisle sometimes. Too. You just repeat what they're saying, and they will continue to talk. And that's what you, this is your, like, information gathering, okay? It's not, and it's not, you're not going to get information through an interrogation. You're going to get information by being cool and casual because if kids sense that you are going to, like, call the principal or call the teacher, they might shut down because they might not want you to do that. If they sense that they're going to get in trouble, they might shut down because they don't want to get in trouble. If they sense that you're going to criticize how they're handling it, they're probably going to shut down. They don't want to be criticized. So you're trying to just listen more than you talk, and when you talk, Make sure that it's to try to extend the conversation instead of jumping towards telling them what to do. You're validating. You're wondering. I wonder if you, if, what if you said something like this? What do you think would happen? So you're, you're just getting them to think. You're not telling them what to do. Ignore it. Tell the teacher. You're avoiding those sorts of instructions. Um, let your child take the lead by asking empowering questions like, have you thought about what to do? Do you have any ideas? Do you think talking to her might help? So you're not saying, well, tell her. You're asking, do you think talking to her would help? Because sometimes kids will say, not really, because then I think she's just going to fake it. She's just going to say she wasn't doing that. Or, you know, that she might, they might have a reason why they don't want to try your suggestion. Um, and so we're offering support and guidance, not orders or directions, instructions about what to do. I do this in my office, and I would suggest you do it at home because there is something about getting this down on paper or even better than paper, a whiteboard. I don't know what it is about whiteboards, but it makes kids talk and, like, want to solve things. Um, but bring out paper or whiteboard and write down, okay, what's the problem? Kate laughs whenever I make a mistake. She repeats what I said wrong so other people hear it, and I feel like she's trying to get them to laugh at me, too. Now, a kid, depending on their age, is not necessarily going to lay out the problem for you like this, but your job when you're listening and information gathering is to think about how to sum up the problem. And it's not in a way that's like, well, Kate's being mean. Kate's not a nice friend. It's more like describing what's happening. Um, from what your child is saying. And then write down the goal. This is your child's goal, not your goal. So, and this is where you might have to ask questions. Well, do you feel like you want to stay friends with Kate? I always ask that question because most of the time kids will say, yeah, I want to, be fr I want to keep being friends with her. I just don't want her to treat me that way. You can ask, you know, do you want, or do you want to stop being friends with her? Do you want her to understand how you feel? Do you want her to change something? But so you can ask some questions that get your child thinking about what is their actual goal or what are their actual goals in the for the resolution. 
of this problem. So the goal might be, I want to get Kate to stop laughing at me. I want to keep Kate as a friend. I want to be able to talk without feeling nervous or embarrassed, like she's going to make fun of me for what I'm saying. And then you brainstorm. So on that piece of paper or on that whiteboard, you list, you, if your kid doesn't know what brainstorming is, you say, this is where we come up with as many ideas as possible to solve this problem. We're not evaluating any of these ideas. We're just listing as many as possible. If your kid's silly and likes a joke, you know, you can say things like, um, I'm going to just change schools. Uh, well, that's it. We can homeschool you. Let's put it on the list. No more being around Kate. You're being homeschooled. Or, you know, I'm going to tell, uh, we're going to have Kate move or something like that. You know, we'll just put a, a moving sign in their yard and we'll get them out of the neighborhood. And you won't have to worry about Kate anymore. But you can come up with other, help come up with other ideas. And when it's brainstorming, this is when you can't, you're not telling them what to do, but you can offer as many suggestions as you want here. And you're going to write down as many suggestions as your kid has. But so it might be, I'm just going to stop talking. I'll just never speak in class again. That way I won't have to worry about being embarrassed and she won't make fun of me. I'm going to laugh at everything Kate says. I'm going to make her feel how I feel. Then she'll stop. I'm going to tell her about how I feel, and I'm going to ask her to stop. I'm going to text her about how I feel and ask her to stop. You, you know, mom, could you talk to her mom about it? I'll ignore it. I'll just pretend like it's not happening. Or I'll change schools. And then you, you take your pen or pencil or dry erase marker, and you go through the list and evaluate it against the goal. Okay, so if you stop talking... Would that help you reach your goal of getting Kate to stop laughing at you? Maybe, because if you don't say anything that she thinks is funny, she might stop laughing at you. Keep Kate as a friend. Will that help? Mm, I don't know, because then I'm just never actually going to be allowed to talk to her, so it's kind of hard to have a friendship with somebody you're not talking to. Would, you be, would that help you with your goal of being able to talk without feeling nervous or embarrassed? No. Okay, so we'll cross that one out. You know, and you continue going through, well, laughing at everything she says. Is that going to help you with your goals of keeping Kate as your friend, or is it going to create more drama? You know, and then, okay, that's going to create more drama. We'll cross that one out. What about telling her how you feel or texting her? Or, you know, and sometimes you leave something on the list that you may or may not agree with, but that your kid is rooting for. You know, if, if it's something that you think is possibly reasonable, Keep it on the list. If it's something that just really doesn't go um, in line with the goals, it's not going to work to help you reach your goal, cross it off. But then what you do is you just decide, what, are, what am I going to do? Which strategy am I going to go with? And you help your kid prepare by practicing and role playing and helping them say it over again or helping them craft their compliment sandwich. It's hard for kids to come up with a compliment sandwich. It's hard for a lot of adults to come up with compliment sandwiches. But it's something that you can really practice makes perfect. And so keep coming up with, you know, what's something positive I can say about Kate or the situation or whatever it is. Practice it. Try it out. Actually try the solution. Sometimes it depends on your kid's temperament a lot. But some kids will try things like, I'm just going to ignore it. I'm just not going to say anything. I'm going to see if it goes away. And that's really what they want to do, and that's what they're comfortable doing. And you, you say, okay, try that. You know, and then we'll check in later. So you're going to try it out, and then we're going to evaluate. And we can go back to the goal and say, okay, so you're just going to ignore it. How is it going? Is it working? Like, has she stopped laughing at the stuff that you're saying? Do you feel embarrassed or nervous when you're talking? And if your kid says, I still worry about what to say, and she's still laughing. You know, then maybe we have to go back to the list and try another solution. Or maybe there's some, another idea that's come up. But you're getting the conversation going. And you're teaching the kid these steps to solve a problem. And when kids are younger, it's usually easier problems to solve. And when they get older, they're tougher, trickier problems. But if they're practicing, they're getting better and better at doing this and feeling more comfortable solving these problems to, to make sure that they're maintaining their boundaries and keeping healthy friendships. Uh, okay. 
I think that there is a role for communicating with the school. I think if you believe, you know, you've had some of these conversations with your kid, you've observed some stuff, and you think there's a possibility that this could be actual true bullying, talk to the school about it. Not in a, my kid's being bullied and what are you going to do about it way, but more of a, I'm concerned about this, can we try to figure out what's going on here? You know, and, and, and get the school involved in helping you figure out what's happening. Because sometimes what's coming home and being reported is not necessarily what's happening at school. Sometimes what's coming home and being reported is exactly what's happening at school, but people at school aren't necessarily aware of it. You know, and that's something where we want to make sure that we're keeping those lines of communication open. If you, if you need an, a perspective other than your child, so some kids are not great reporters of what's going on, and it's really hard to figure out, especially like so I work with a lot of kids with autism, and so sometimes kids with autism may be being bullied, but they're not act they actually aren't interpreting it as bullying, but parents are concerned about it, or, but the kids have a hard time reporting what's going on, or sometimes kids are thinking that they're being bullied and their perspective is really off from what's actually happening. And so we, we need other, other people's perspectives to look at what's going on and make some, um, some reports about what's happening. If your child's been trying to solve problems without much success and you feel you need support, so if, let's say, it's that example of, you know, Kate's uh, laughing at everything I say, and your kid is, has tried some solutions and it's not really working, most teachers are pretty okay with an email or a phone call saying, I just wanted to pick your brain about what you think is going on. You know, we've been working through this at home. What, what are you seeing in the classroom? Is there anything you're seeing in the classroom? And then the teacher is probably going to be able to provide you with a lot of information about sometimes, you know, yeah, we've, we've had that issue with some other students too, and here's how we're handling it, or here's what we're going to try to do. Or the teacher might be able to provide some support, like by modeling some other kinds of things, might not be aware that it's, you know, these two kids are friends. And so they might think it's, the teacher might think it's friendly teasing, not realizing how, how that student is feeling, but would, would want to put support in place if, if they could. Um, so keeping the, the lines of communication with school open. And then seeking help. So if you're outside of school, if you're concerned about your child's mood or behavior, like you feel like this is contributing to some depression or anxiety or school avoidance behaviors, um, these, those are all things that might tell you if it, maybe it is bullying and we got to do something about it, or maybe our kid really needs some assistance with assertiveness or being comfortable maintaining boundaries and, and that we, other people, professionals, can help with that. If you're noticing patterns of problems that are just really difficult to solve for your child, that might be another time where getting somebody else's perspective, a professional's perspective, um, could be helpful. And, of course, the resources that we have available, Connecting for Kids, um, Sarah mentioned the podcasts on the website, as well as parents you can talk to who've been through similar kinds of things, social skills, uh, experiences, elementary school experiences where kids are with other um, same-age peers, talks on the subjects, therapists um, outside of school can be helpful, social skills groups if your kid's working on developing some of these skills can be helpful. And just when I mention things like extracurricular activities, what I really am referring to is something that provides your child with some fun, where they're feeling confident or they're feeling comfortable and secure, sort of an area where a domain where they're feeling some success. Um, and that can be something that, that sort of helps balance out some of these conflicts that, that they, or problems with friends that they might be experiencing.